because what I've learned in that journey is that you, as a human, cannot and are not capable of understanding or knowing the outcomes as they occur. And I will tell you here, now 16 years later, that losing everything protected, promoted, and loved me more than any other event in my life to put me in a better place, a better situation. But when it happened, it took me a while to learn that perspective of how protected and promoted I am. If you're a real estate investor and are wondering how to raise and leverage private money to make more profit on every deal, then you're in the right place. On Raising Private Money, we'll speak with new and seasoned investors to dissect their deals and extract the best tips and strategies to help you get the money, because the money comes first. Now here's your host, Jay Connor. Welcome to another amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, your host, and oh my lands, have we got an amazing guest today. You may have heard of the name David Meltzer, but let me tell you something. This guy is unbelievable. He's raised over $100 million in, uh, in funds and private money, and then <laughs> he lost over $100 million in 2009, and then after 2009, he's made it all back and even more. His credentials are unbelievable. In this episode, we dive deep into, first of all, how in the world can you really and truly be happy all the time? He's going to give you specific recommendations. In fact, David's uh, purpose on this planet now is to show and help over 1 billion people become happy. We talk about in this episode, overcoming fear and taking action in spite of fear. We talk about how you can truly be abundant in everything that you do. So anyway, in just a moment, you're going to meet my very special guest, Mr. David Meltzer, right after this. Welcome to the show, David. How are you today? I am fantastic. I just want to thank you so much. I cannot wait to speak with you. Your community is aligned and resonates with everything that I love everything about making a lot of money, helping a lot of people and how to, and thanks for having me. Absolutely, David. Well, I tell you what, you have got a, I don't, I can't even come up with the adjective to describe your story, your experience, your history. I don't know if it's fascinating, interesting. Those two adjectives are not nearly good enough, but anyway, let's go ahead and dive in. I mean, talk about being able, I mean, you have, you have, plowed the ground that's never been plowed before, I don't think, on overcoming the obstacles that you have overcome in such a short period of time, you know, losing over a hundred million dollars in 2009 and then coming back better than ever before, truly happy after you discovered that you thought you were happy and you really weren't happy. And now you've come back, you're happier than ever before. You've made more money now since then than ever before. The first question burning in my mind is how in the world did you overcome that? I learned an important lesson that I wish I would have listened to uh, as I had many red flags and many suggestions to learn. It's the mad words. It's called ask for help. You see, I was born with nothing and I was fortunate and unfortunate enough to become a millionaire nine months to law school and a multimillionaire three years later when we exited for $3.4 billion in 1995. And in that journey past that point, everything turned up gold. My nickname with friends and family was Midas. And I started to believe my own bullshit. No uh, offense attended with the word, but I was full of shit. And uh, it took a, a deep dive uh, down to zero in order to shift the mindset, heart set, and hand set of understanding radical humility compared to ignorant arrogance. And that lesson is a very valuable lesson. I wish it didn't cost me over a hundred million dollars in 2009, but it did, but it was well worth it to live in radical humility with not only my search of wisdom, but a unwavering faith that there's more than enough of everything for everyone, that there is something bigger than me that loves me, protects me and promotes me even more than my mom. 
And that journey of wisdom and faith has helped me not only uh, my own journey, but empower uh, others to empower others in the same respect so that they can live in abundance as well. I love it. I love it. You know, um, I, I know part of your mission is to empower other people to really find out what true happiness is. And instead of, you know, fooling themselves, you know, you got there's distractions of social media and, you know, a lot, a lot of people walking around, they think they know what happiness is, but since they really don't, then that creates confusion for self-awareness. You talk about that as to what they really want. So the question is, how did you, how does someone else actually figure out what they really want? Well, it starts with one, giving meaning to the past that's aligned with where you think you want to be. So understanding through humility that we don't know what we don't know, and we can at best each day think about what we want and that's the best that we can do. You see, human beings are not capable of understanding or knowing outcome. I had no way of knowing or understanding at the time when I lost everything. And talk about losing everything. Not only did I lose over $100 million, but the only reason, Jay, that I wanted to be rich was I wanted to buy my mom a house and a car. I was a single mom, six kids. She packed my dinner in a paper bag and drove me around in a country squire station wagon after she was done teaching second grader to fill up greeting card turnstiles at convenience stores. And I said to myself at five years old when my dad left that I was going to complete my happiness by buying my mom a house and a car. And when I lost everything, I had to go tell my mom, not only I was bankrupt, but I didn't take my name to the title of the home that I bought her. So I actually had lost my mom's home. And to go through a journey to learn about unconditional love, to learn that money doesn't buy happiness, it doesn't buy love, but it simply allows us to shop. And if you shop for the right things for the right reason, through humility with wisdom and faith, that you can have a perspective of everything for everyone. You can live in this world of more than enough. You still got to be a ferocious person, but you need to be more Buddhist in surrendering to the outcomes. Because what I've learned in that journey is that you, a human, cannot and are not capable of understanding or knowing the outcomes as they occur. And I will tell you here now, 16 years later, that losing everything protected, promoted, and loved me more than any other event in my life to put me in a better place, a better situation. But when it happened, it took me a while to learn that perspective of how protected and promoted I am. So are you saying that part of experiencing true happiness is knowing what your bigger purpose is. It's got nothing to do directly with how much money's in the bank account. Absolutely. I ask myself every day when we think about what do I think I want day in alignment where I think I want to be in the future. Therefore, what lessons or meaning do I give my past? You see, there's two things that limit people. One is the name of the past. That will limit you to a brighter, better future, but also your own self-image. You will never overachieve your own self-image. So I utilize that mindset of asking myself, what is it that I think I want and for the sake of what do I want it? And when I ask myself for the sake of what, I'm tying in a purpose. So instead of searching for a why, I'm applying my why to get me where I want to better. And so I created different daily practices and values and execution models that are in my books. By the way, I'd be more than happy to sign my book, send it to anyone in your community. I'll pay for the book. I'll pay for shipping. So no uh, type of a quid pro quo. I will pay for everything. Just email me, david at dmelcher.com, and I can teach you how to get everything you want in life by working hard, by being ferocious every day, but allowing the outcomes to be lessons to you to a better place, a better position. So that is such a kind offer of you, David. What's the name of the book uh, that you're going to be sending out? Connected Goodness, How to Manifest Everything You Desire in Life and Business. Uh, and I'll be happy. Warren Moon, my business partner, wrote the forward to the book. And it's a combination of a theoretical, but very pragmatic Napoleon Hill type of book that talks about belief and inspiration, but it gives you step pragmatic practices from someone who has lost a lot of money, made a lot of money, 
uh, in their lives to give you some pragmatic tools along with some great mindset tips. I love it. So again, that email address that David is uh, uh, so kind to offer his book, he's paying for the book, he's paying for shipping. All you got to do is uh, give your mailing address. His email address is david at D for David, David at dmeltzer.com. That's M E L T Z E R.com. And of course, that will be in the show notes as well. Now, I, I want to share a quick little story from me, David, to give some context. And then I'm going to ask you the question. Not long ago, a very, very close friend of mine, uh, he and I were riding down the road. In fact, we go to church together. And just out of the blue, he said, Jay, when is enough enough? And I said, well, I think I know what you're asking when you ask me that question, but what are you really asking? When is enough enough? He says, well, you've got all the money in the world that you would want or need, and you're traveling the nation all the time, speaking at all these events. You know, you're working many, many hours a week. You could sit at home if you wanted to. When is enough work enough work? And when is enough money enough money? And I said, oh, and then he said, how do you reconcile the scripture that says, be content with whatever station in life you are? I said, I thought I knew what the question meant. And now I understand the question. And here was my answer. My answer was enough is never enough when it's not about you. And so that's my short story. That was my answer to my friend's question. But do you ever, have you ever felt like in the past you were not good enough or do you ever struggle with that still today? Well, it's interesting that you ask because one of the core principles that I live by in my faith-based existence like you is understanding yeah, more than enough, understanding the idea of giving. You see, so many people, especially moms, first responders, our veterans, teachers, they adhere to a philosophy which I agree with, which is the more I give, the more I'll receive. But in exploration, especially with religious texts, what the Bible actually says is the more that you give, the more you're given. And people have a difficult time, one, through gratitude and forgiveness, both taught within the Bible, through gratitude and forgiveness, recognizing, being aware of all that we're given through that gracious, forgiving perspective. But even worse, what you are touching upon is most people feel worthy of all they're given. So they give 100%, but then they feel guilty or shameful. No, no, I, I only want 98% back. And eventually what they don't realize, if you keep giving 100% of what you have and you only receive back 98%, you're in a zero game. Sooner or later, you're going to be at nothing and now you can't give anything to anyone. And for the sake of abundance, for the sake of helping others with what you have, what I suggest is you realize the more that you give, the more you're given. Elevate your awareness to all that you're given and then feel worthy of all that you're given and then even feel comfortable and confident with wisdom and faith to ask for more. Because instead of living in a zero sum game where you end up with less and less and less out of shame, blame, justification, out of fear, we can absolutely in a world where we give more, we're given more, we're worthy of receiving more and we are confident and comfortable asking for more than more. And then we end up with more than more and then we're given more than more and we receive more than more. And we, again, can ask for more than more than more. You can see where the abundant, the infinite faithful end up with more than enough of everything for everyone, not for themselves, for everyone. It's an infinite, abundant, unified system that you're protected and promoted and loved by something so much bigger than you that's omniscient and all powerful and loves you more than your mom. So can you see any reason why you wouldn't want to share in the everything for everyone perspective instead of just enough for me and eventually you end up with not enough and you're not enough to help other people and they end up in a world of not enough. I love it. And as you were just sharing that thought on, on asking, giving, receiving, being, being grateful for, for all that you're given. It reminded me, uh, as you were talking, 
in uh, the book of James in the Bible, uh, James, and I'll paraphrase, uh, James says, you ask, but when you ask, you doubt that you're going to receive. So the advice is when you ask, don't doubt that it's going to be given and received. What's your comment on that outlook and perspective? That is so true. That's where faith lies, that if you felt or knew that there was more than enough of everything for everyone, why wouldn't you ask? And if you knew how much people love to give and how great you make them feel, that you're actually cheating them when you don't ask them for help, for what they're good at, what they have. When you're not living in this infinite loop that God has given us to give, receive, and be worthy of both, and to feel comfortable and confident in your faith, that we have no doubt that the omniscient, all-powerful has more than enough of everything for everyone that we can live. And when we ask three things happen, and here's my biochemical proof, by the way, Jay, is God gives you a doggy biscuit in three situations. When you give, you get a biochemical reaction with dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. It is a happiness doggy biscuit. And it's God's way of saying, keep giving, keep giving, son. I'm good. Every time you give, I'm going to make you feel good. Biochemically, I'm going to make you feel good. And then when people receive, they get the same doggy biscuit do with dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins. They're released. In other words, God said, son, may you receive everything you're given. Feel good about it. Here's a dose of biochemical proof that you're doing the right thing. But here's What's now tying in the infinite loop is that everyone that witnesses this, Jay, everyone that witnesses giving and receiving receives the same doggy business, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. It's God's way of saying, hey, let us all live in this infinite loop of giving, of giving, of receiving, and asking for more. If God didn't want all of us to have everything for everyone, then he wouldn't reinforce it giving us that doggy biscuit and making us all feel so good when we give, receive, or witness giving and receiving. You know, I didn't know I was getting doggy biscuits, but I knew I felt good. <laughs> yeah, good. <laughs> <laughs> now, now here's I an important... Him, I can call them gaudy biscuits. We'll just turn gaudy the biscuits around, there you go. right? There you go. Dog backwards God. <laughs> just as long as it's got extra cheese in it. Now, here's, a all <laughs> here's an all-important question, David, because like you, I coach um, people, specifically, I coach people, real estate investors, help them raise private money for their real estate deals. But I also work with them on mindset. You work with people on mindset. And one of the mindsets that invariably all uh, my entire community, in fact, um, human, human, all humans deal with is when they go, when we go to do something brand new, we go to do something brand new. Fear so often holds people back. The, the, the uh, afraid they're either afraid of it, rejection. They're afraid of failure. They're afraid of not being, you know, getting out of their comfort zone. What advice uh, can you give in the short amount of time that we have? What advice uh, or or coaching can you give on what people can actually put into action? to help them overcome the fear. I know what Dale Carnegie taught me when I was 24 years old. I want to hear your answer. <laughs> what a fabulous question. And I appreciate uh, how prepared you are because you're asking me all of the right things, which is indicative of how you and I are aligned. Uh, what I found so interesting in fear, and I've studied Carnegie and Napoleon Hill and many others, is that fear in the pragmatic is difficult to understand. We don't know our genetic inheritance of fear, our energetic inheritance of fear. We can spend a lifetime in therapy uh, trying to figure out the childhood traumas and the impact that it has created and the fear that it has created, the diminished capacity that it has given us. So I have a different mindset that I give people. I expect you to keep on learning about what you're afraid of, but in the pragmatic practice of being productive, accessible, and gracious, every single day in order to be more efficient, effective, and statistically successful in what you want or better in your life to help other people and to have a lot of fun. What I suggest people do is to start a practice of identifying your reaction to fear. You see, the reaction to fear is instant and obvious. When you're angry, frustrated, guilty, resentful, when you're separate, 
inferior, superior. When you're worried, all of these things interfere with what you already are. I am and your potential of I am. You're interfering with your God. You are interfering with your potential, your truth. So I shift the paradigm when we talk about fear and say, look, fear is a difficult thing to understand. It's genetic, it's energetic, it's childhood. There's all types of conscious, subconscious, and unconscious uh, meanings that we give that limit us. But in a pragmatic day, what I suggest you do is get into the practice of finding the clues of how you react to fear. Do you get angry, frustrated, anxious, worried, separate, and fear superior, guilty, shameful? What is your reaction to fear? And then instead of trying to resist it, go over it, under it, through it, around it, lie to it, manipulate it, cheat it, or deny it, just simply stop. Stop and take a big breath and breathe and get down to center and then mind yourself, remember yourself, recollect yourself with that beautiful God of yours, the omniscient, all-powerful knowing, and then roll into the right trajectory of where you want to be. Stop escalating and accelerating in the wrong trajectory by creating more worry and more fear. Instead, take the instant and obvious clue to create and see the patterns of how you're interfering. You see the great energy gap. It's I am, and this is what I want people to think I am. And what we need to do is get into the practice of identifying how am I reacting to the fears that exist every single day and how can I spend minutes and moments, not days, weeks, months, years in that fear and utilizing and understanding when I'm afraid and I react to fear, my mind, my body and soul are on fire. Everybody knows when I'm on fire, you got to stop, you got to drop and you got to roll. I love it. I love it. We're just about out of time, David, and I could talk to you for all day long but I got two quick questions and you can answer them quickly. Whatever first comes to mind. First of all, what is one of your daily habits that you are committed to doing that helps keep you happy and on track? And secondly, what advice do you give people to stop doing the limiting habits that they have in their life that they want to get rid of? Beautiful. Well, my number one habit is unwinding routine which is my tomorrow starts today. So I unwind, put my body, mind, and soul in a position to recover and access information when I sleep. And so that's the number one habit that allows me to plateau and grow every day is to start my day at night, unwinding and recovering for the next day and accessing information I can use. And as far as developing the habits, uh, I use five daily practices to utilize my activities in a trajectory of where I want to be. Know your what, what you want. Know your who, who can help and who can help you. Know your how by utilizing time productively, accessibly, and graciously. And then know your now. If you know what to do now and know what to do next, 100% of the things you do now get done. Prioritization is the antidote to procrastination and feel overwhelmed. And instead of searching for your why, apply that why. For the sake of what am I doing this? And if you ask yourself and utilize those five daily practices, I promise you, you will make a lot of money, help a lot of people, and have a lot of fun. God bless you, David. Words of wisdom that is, is unbelievable how much we packed in to about 20 minutes. One more time, thank you big time, David, for offering your book that you're going to send out even free and, and everyone for goodness sakes, I'm going to do it. You do it. Email David at David at D Meltzer, M E L T Z E R.com. What should they put in the subject line, David? Just a request for your book or connected to goodness. Uh, anything short and sweet. I'll know it's for that. Just, uh, I will sign it, send it to you, pay for shipping in the book. I appreciate everybody. And remember, be more interested than interesting. Be kind to your future self and good and do good deeds. Jay, you're leading an amazing community of people, and I appreciate all that you do to empower others to be happy. Thank you so much, David. Well, there you have it. Another amazing, amazing episode of Raising Private Money. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority, and I need your help. Something that would just mean the world to me. You know, I never sell anything here on the show. Um, I don't have any paid ads at all. The only thing I can ask you to do 
is to share this episode with at least one person that you know it would make an impact. And then you will be giving it ahead first. Look forward to seeing you on the very next episode of Raising Private Money with Jay Connor. Are you feeling inspired by the knowledge you gained in this episode? Then head over to jconnor.com slash money guide. That's jconner.com slash money guide and download your free guide that shares seven reasons why private money will skyrocket your real estate investing business right now. Again, that's jconnor.com slash money guide to get your free guide.